On the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. This is North Devon District Hospital in the suburb of Pilton on the outskirts of Barnstable. 24 hours a day it is a hive of activity. But what's this? A character that we know only too well. It's Wally, the comedy rhinoceros. I wonder what he's doing here. Could he possibly be coming to visit someone because he doesn't seem to know where he's going? Hi, I'm Karina Downs, talking from Barnstable Hospital on a trip, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of On The Track. But before we start, I just want to say how incredibly proud and impressed I am by my lovely wife, who, even though she was in considerable pain and discomfort and just about to have a series of three different operations, she still filmed an introduction to On The Track and let us mess around with rhino heads in the middle of North Devon District Hospital. And I think it takes a pretty remarkable woman to do that. But now, on with the show. Well, Charlotte, it's nearly springtime. In fact, probably by the time that they by the time we actually end up broadcasting this, I think it will be springtime. And so, as it's springtime, I would like to say we should have a look at Loch Ness Monster sightings. But you know what? There hasn't been any. There haven't been any at all. So, let's have a look at something else that seems to be taking the cryptozoological world by, mad uh, by um, storm over the last few weeks. This is 48 seconds of video from a mountain pass in Washington State. What do you think of this? It is, I believe, a trail camera. Mm. Now this actually comes from local government. It comes from the Washington State Department of Transportation, which I assume is similar to uh, the Department of Roads or whatever it's called here. So, what do you think of it? By the way, I'm going to assume that we can uh, broadcast this because as it's American government, it will be property, it's American government video, it will be in the public domain. So, I think it's okay for us to use it. What do you think it is? I mean, it does look like maybe someone in a suit, but like, oh, it's not like clear enough to tell. On Wednesday, January the 22nd, the Department of Transport and Washington State's Twitter account proclaimed Sasquatch spotted and provided photographic evidence of something strange on our Sherman Pass SR20 webcam. Granted, the photos were grainy and from far away, as most Sasquatch photos seem to be, but it was proof of something. They continue. If you look closely by the tree on the west, left, there looks to be 
something, it might be Sasquatch, we'll leave that up to you. The post went on to read. A day later, they posted a piece of video claiming that it showed Bigfoot using a wildlife crossing over Interstate 90, just each of Snockwall... Snockwallami, Snockwallami Pass. That's a nice name, isn't it? Usually we burst out laughing when Karina has difficulty in um, pronouncing foreign words. I thought we'd be okay in America, but yes, Snockwallami Pass is presumably a Native American word, and the post said, I think that Bigfoot is making the rounds across our mountain passes. Close quotes. So, maybe something is going on up there. So, what do you think? Do you think that we have... Um, do you think that we have conclusive proof on that, bit, on that video? Or do you think it's something else? Or what do you think? I don't really have that much of an opinion. It looks like it could be a guy in the suit. It looks like just someone's taking off a straw, but then again... We obviously don't know enough about Bigfoot to see what their like their movements are. So it literally... no. Do you see anything about it that makes it look non-human? Apart from their hair. Let's go and have a look back at the. Let's have a look at the video again. Does the outward appearance make it look non-human? I'm not sure. Yeah, like it does look like it's. Fixed. It does look like it's thick set, mm. and although it's too grainy to really be able to tell whether that is long hair covering its body, it might be. Yeah, it actually does, doesn't it? Mm. You can. Now the interesting thing, which I've just noted, look at the way. In a minute, you'll see how he turns around. We've seen something like that before, haven't we? There. Mm. Did you see that? Yeah. You've seen the uh, Roger Patterson footage, haven't you? The famous footage. Yeah. Remember when... Is it just me or is the big foot in that? Also turn around. In exactly the same way. Yeah. See, it turns around in exactly the same way. Mm. Now, do I don't know whether that means that the footage from Washington was carefully done by an actor doing exactly the same thing, or whether this is characteristic of how Bigfoot, or whatever this creature is, actually walks. So, Charlotte, yes. is this evidence of Bigfoot? Possibly. Is it, do you think it is A, totally wonderful footage, B, totally a total fake, C, you don't know? C. Yeah, I think it's C. But I think it's interesting enough that we should add it to the sort of evidence pile. Mm. Rather than, rather than dismiss it out of yeah. hand. Now, talking about dismissing things out of hand, last episode, mm -hmm. we went through all the Loch Ness Monster sightings from yeah. 2019. Yeah. With the possible exception, let's be kind about it, there was the one... There was one which did appear to show something rippling at the surface of the water. Yeah. And there was the other one which did appear to show something sizable about 30 feet down. Mm -hmm. Both of those were interesting. But apart from those, all the rest were just specks and mm. blobs and nothing. Yeah. Don't know about you, Charlotte, but I'm beginning to think that it's not surprising that a lot of people, ordinary people, whatever that means, don't take cryptozoology seriously when the best evidence we can come up with is 
things that look like fly specks on a camera lens. Yeah. I think we're going to have to do a bit better than that. Yeah. But whether or not it's a hoax, this footage from Washington is a bit better than that. I think that's. Yeah. I think it's worth keeping an eye on that story. Yeah. Over the years, some people have claimed that the Centre for Fortune Zoology is a cult. Hello, hello, hello. What we got here then? A dune buggy up a tour. We're just here looking for that there bottomless pit the folk says around here. Arr. Some people within cryptozoology believe that there are still dinosaurs on the Earth. Dinosaurs thrived in the warm temperatures and mild weather of the Mesozoic era. Then, one day, 66 million years ago, a huge meteorite crashed to Earth in what is now the Gulf of Mexico. All of a sudden, the Earth became much colder and darker. Plants died and food became scarce, and three quarters of the creatures living on Earth, including the dinosaurs, went extinct. But one group of dinosaurs survived, and they still survive today. Birds are descendants of theropod dinosaurs and have spread all across the globe. Some are tiny, some are enormous, and they're all sizes in between. I'm fascinated by these creatures, which is why John called me the Watcher of the Skies. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another segment of Watcher of the Skies. This week our old friend Mike Davis sent us this, which seems appropriate, because in this episode we are going to talk about pink flamingos. No Jonathan, don't be silly. No, we are not talking about that revolting film, as everyone, especially my idiotic husband, knows perfectly well. We are talking about the bird. This is Northern Burrows, a few miles from Biddeford, near where we live in North Devon. And this is a pond called the Mere, which is particularly interesting because it is seasonal. Every winter it appears, but by the middle of summer it is just a dry part of the Northern Burrows car park and it is a particularly good place for bird watching. However, in all the years that John and I have been visiting looking for unusual birds, we have never had the luck that John and his family had back in the winter of 1972 or 1973 because on one fantastic occasion they saw something bright pink in the middle of the water. It was a flamingo. Flamingos are a type of wading bird in a family with an unpronounceable um, name which in turn is the only bird family in an order with an even more unpronounceable name. Four flamingo species are distributed throughout the Americas, including the Caribbean, and two species are native to Africa, Asia and Europe. Yes, you heard me correctly. One species of flamingo is from Europe. The greater flamingo, which is, you will not be surprised to learn, the largest of the species to be found in parts of Africa and Asia as well as southern Europe, including Spain, Albania, North Macedonia, Greece, Portugal, Italy and the Camargue region of France, which is only 900 and something miles away from where we live here in North Devon. And when you can fly, 900 and something miles is not a very long way. To put it in context, it would be a longer journey if we decided to drive up to Edinburgh for the festival and then drive back again. I was also very surprised to find out whilst researching this that something new has been discovered about flamingos. Rather than them being related to storks, they are actually related to grebes. Out of place flamingos are reported surprisingly often in the United Kingdom. A bloke dealing with a bird walking organisation in Frodsham near Merseyside writes, Flamingos of one species or another graced the Frodsham and the Mersey estuary over 14 different years between 1973 to 1999. All birds are thought to be adults and it is highly likely that all the birds were escapes from the captivity. Rumours have regularly circulated on the Cheshire birding scene these sightings being linked to Bellevue Zoo, Greater Manchester, that closed officially in September 1977. And whilst it is indeed likely that most of these birds were escapees from captivity, 
Some of them may not have been. In 2002, the British Ornithologists Union Records Committee, or BOURC, conducted a review of the status of Greater Flamingo Phenisopterus ruba in Britain. The review concludes that the species should be retained in Category D. BOURC consider that sightings in Britain of this species relate to escaped birds, either from collections or from a feral breeding population on the Dutch-German border. But out-of-place flamingos in the United Kingdom are not a new phenomenon. Howard Saunders wrote about them in an illustrated manual of British birds published in 1899 by Gurney and Jackson and noted that, usually after particularly grand storms, flamingos have been recorded as far north as Staffordshire. In September 1881, an adult flamingo was seen for a week or so on the estate of the late Sir John H. Crewe. There, while others were observed during the late 1800s at New Romney and on the Isle of Sheppey. Whether Mr Saunders's particularly grand storms blew the birds all the way north from the Carmarg or merely significantly dam damaged the enclosures of private waterfowl collections is a moot point. But at least one contemporary zoo believes that it would not be long before we have bona fide British flamingos. Birdland in the Cotswolds had a blog which in 2014 claimed Although it won't be long before a genuine wild flamingo grazes our shores, this is something that we have been saying for the last 30 years. In 2018, the Daily Telegraph noted that flamingos living in a British wildfowl reserve have laid eggs for the first time in 15 years after the heat wave mimicked conditions they would normally experience in the wild. The rare flock of Andean flamingos at WWT Slimbridge in Gloucester last produced eggs in 2003 when conditions were similarly stifling and the aforementioned blog about Merseyside birds and it's so tempting here to call them live birds suggests that some of the flamingos there will have lived there for quite a few years. With climate change, claims that British weather has become much hotter in recent years are impossible to, de to deny. But whilst various British newspapers will be pumping out shock stories about unwanted immigrants from Europe, we think that if with the changing climate, and possibly even more importantly, the fact that many of Britain's rivers are no longer important from a mercantile point of view, and no longer have to be kept clear for cargo ships and barges and will become partly silted up, providing an ideal flamingo habitat that, like the bird gardens in the Cotswolds have said, it will not be long before we have bona fide flamingos of our own. And that's it for this month, and so I shall hand you over to Jonathan so he can tell you more about the latest new and rediscovered species and stop trying to make a series of increasingly desperate divine jokes. Goodbye. Well, this month I'm going to talk about giant turtles. But first of all, I want to show you this. I've always been fascinated by cave fish ever since I saw some blind cave tetras in a tropical fish shop in Hong Kong when I was a boy. And in the last 50 years, I've realized that there are actually several different species, in fact, quite a lot of different species of fish which have adapted for life in an environment with no light whatsoever. Some of these cave fish are actually totally new species. Others are just races of better known species from above ground. But now look at this. They've discovered what is at the moment the world's largest known species of subterranean fish. 
Species which are adapted to living in caves are known as proglomorphic, which, if you look at the root of the Latin name there, actually makes perfect sense. And in February 2019, a troglomorphic fish was discovered in a cave in Meghalaya in the northeastern part of India. The largest individual seen in the cave was in excess of 400 millimetres in standard length, making it by far the largest known subterranean fish found to date. Initial investigations indicate that it's a close anatomical match to the golden mouse here, Tor putatora but it differs in its depigmentation, lack of eyes, and in its subterranean habitat. The golden mouse here is an endangered species of cyprinid fish that's found in rapid streams, riverine pools, and lakes in the Himalayan region. Its native range is within the basins of the Indus, Ganges, and Brahmaputra rivers. It's a popular game fish, once believed to be the largest species of mouse here, and it can reach up to 2.75 metres in length. It's threatened by habitat loss, habitat degradation and overfishing, and it has already declined by an estimated 50% of its habitat. This omnivorous species is generally found near the surface, in water that ranges from 13 to 30 degrees centigrade. However, one has to ask the question, why the fish that's known for living on the surface of the water suddenly go underground to take up a subterranean lifestyle? It's tempting to hypothesize that this is as a direct result of the pressures upon the species as a whole and that somehow a gestalt, collective gestalt of the Marcia species realised that the best way that it would survive would be by going to an environment where there were no longer any fishermen. But this is all getting a bit esoteric. I think we need to go and have a look at some giant turtles. Stupendemis geographicus was an enormous species of side-necked turtle. Its fossils have been found in northern South America in rock dating from the middle Miocene to the very start of the Pliocene between 13 and 5 million years ago. It was discovered back in 1976 when I was still a spiky-haired young Herbert listening to the sex pistols, but some new studies done on the species and published recently in Science Advances qualify it, I think, to go in this episode's new and rediscovered slot. And after all, I'm the ringmaster of this particular circus, and if I want to include it, I jolly well shall. Despite being amongst the largest turtles ever known to have lived, the biology and systematics of Stupendemis geographicus remain largely unknown because of scant fragmentary finds. This new research paper describes exceptional specimens and new localities from the Miocene of Venezuela and Colombia the authors document the largest shell ever reported for any extant or extinct turtle with a carapace length of 2.4 meters and an estimated mass of 1.145 kilos, which is almost 100 times the size of its closest living relative, the Amazon River turtle, Peltocephalus dumerilianus, and twice that of the largest known extent species of turtle, the marine leatherback, Dermochelis coricea. These new specimens greatly increase our knowledge of the biology and evolution of this iconic species. The findings suggest the existence of a single giant turtle species across the northern neotropics, but with two shell morphotypes suggestive of sexual dimorphism. Bite marks and punctured bones indicate interactions with the large caimans that also inhabited the northern neotropics. Now, before we go on any further, just in case you don't know what sexual dimorphism is, it is when you can see from the outward appearance that the sexes, male and female, are two different forms. They look different. And that can be seen in lots of birds, lots of fish, and in our own species. Vive la France, I say. 
Now, before we go any further, I'd like to say to any of you who are offended by what I just said, that I am perfectly aware of the difference between sex and gender. I'm biased against all sorts of things, but this isn't one of them. An enormous creature which has been reported from all the world's oceans, but whose identity has not, as yet, been accepted by mainstream science, is a gigantic Chelonian, which is known to the nation as Sumatra, as the father of all the turtles. Some religions even believe that the world itself is carried on the back of a gigantic turtle, a concept which was taken up to comedic effect by science fiction and fantasy author Terry Pratchett. And images of these turtles can be found in temples across Asia where they are often used to hold up pillars. Accounts of these remarkable animals first reached Europe in the early 19th century when Dutch settlers in what is now Indonesia reported native legends of enormous turtles. These stories eventually filtered back to their homeland in Western Europe. However, sightings of such things are not just confined to the tropical waters of the East Indies. In June 1956, seamen of the cargo steamer Rhapsody reported that they had seen a huge turtle about 45 feet long with an all-white shell south of Nova Scotia. The Canadian Coast Guards warned local boats about this gigantic reptile with flippers 15 feet long and capable of raising its head 8 feet out of the water. 73 years earlier, not far away on the Newfoundland banks, a turtle 60 feet long and 40 feet wide had been reported. What's really exciting is that these creatures have even been reported in British waters. In 1959, a shark fisherman called Tex Geddes, who had once been an associate of renowned naturalist and author Gavin Maxwell, was in a boat with James Gavin, a friend of his who was on a holiday. They saw a giant turtle in the sea off the small island of Soe in the Inner Hebrides, and they watched it for an hour in September 1959. They had been watching marine creatures, including some killer whales and a basking shark, when Gavin noticed a black shape on the water about two miles away in the direction of the sky shore. Although this was where the killer whales had last been seen, Geddes was convinced that this was something new. He later wrote, I'm afraid we both stared in amazement as the object came close towards us. For this beast, steaming clearly in our direction, was like some hellish monster of prehistoric times. The head was definitely reptilian, about two foot six high, with large protruding eyes. There were no visible nasal organs, but a large red gash of a mouth which seemed to cut the head in half, and which appeared to have distinct lips. There was at least two foot of clear water behind the neck, less than a foot of which we could see and the creature's back, which rose sharply to its highest point, some three to four feet out of the water, and fell away gradually towards the after end. I would say we saw eight to ten feet of back on the water line. Slowly the creature swam nearer, and the two men watched it until it was parallel to the dinghy only twenty yards away. It kept turning its head from side to side, as if looking all around it. Eventually it submerged and the two men headed gratefully for the shore. One could hardly hope for two better witnesses. They were both experienced seafarers and fishermen who were familiar with the local wildlife. However, these are only a few of many sightings of giant turtles seen in the world's oceans. What could they be? Firstly, in the best traditions of fishermen's tales, I think we can discount any suggestion that there really is a turtle with a shell measuring between 40 and 60 feet in length. At sea, with no phrases of reference, sizes are notoriously difficult to estimate, and it seems certain that whatever it was that the Creamen of the Rhapsody reported seeing, it was considerably smaller. However, as we've just seen, there is a great deal of evidence for the existence, in the distant past at least, of giant Chelonians. Another one existed in the Cretaceous period, which ended 65 million years ago. It was a giant turtle called Archelon. It was found in the Sea of Neobarara over what is now the state of Kansas in the United States. 
The carapace was 12 feet long and the skull was 3 feet long. Some zoologists have speculated that surviving Archelon may be the answer behind the father of all the turtles. However, it's not even necessary to hypothesize such a Jurassic Park type scenario in order to explain these magnificent creatures because there is already an animal very well known to science which could explain all of these sightings. The leathery turtle, or luff, is found in all the world's oceans and although it breeds in the tropics, particularly in Indonesia and coastal Central America, it regularly visits temperate waters including Scandinavia, Nova Scotia and the north of Scotland. The largest specimen ever found was found in the 1980s near Harlech in Wales and was over 9 feet in length. It is certainly not impossible that even larger specimens exist. If one plots a graph showing the distribution curve of the size of animals, one can extrapolate some interesting data. An average human male, for example, is just under 6 foot tall. I am 6 foot 6, going on 6 foot 7, and I've known people who do not suffer from any genetic abnormality who are considerably taller than me. There are also perfectly normal blokes who are considerably shorter than the average. If one extrapolates this frequency curve for an animal like the leathery turtle, then one discovers that if the average length is between 7 and 8 feet, an animal of 9 feet is not uncommon and that leviathans of 12 feet or even more in length are perfectly feasible. The father of all the turtles may not carry the globe on its back, but I believe that it certainly exists. The irony is that these magnificent animals are in danger because of thoughtless behaviour by human beings. Like their ancestor Archelon, these creatures' main diet are jellyfish, and it's a sad fact that many of these giant turtles die each year after eating plastic bags or toy balloons which have drifted out to sea after the turtles mistake them for their favourite food. Remember this next time that you see a charity or promotional event where balloons are released willy-nilly into the air, each one of these apparently harmless bags of rubber could be condemning the father of all the turtles to an agonising and ignominious death. And finally, I would like to say that if you're interested in new and rediscovered species and want to learn more about them as they are accepted by science, why not check out the Novatax blog? It's absolutely fascinating and I waste far too much time on it. I would like to also point out that whereas every effort has been made to contact the copyright holders of these photographs, we believe that we are justified in reproducing them in this not-for-profit video using the policy of fair use. However, if there is anybody who believes that their intellectual or legal rights have been infringed, please contact us and we will do our best to bring the matter to a mutually acceptable solution. First there's this. It feels really strange doing this without Mother. And I really miss her terribly and I'm sure it will be a long, long time before we get over the mother-shaped gap in our lives. But in next month's episode, I actually have no idea what's in next month's episode. I do know that we have the third and final part of my discussion with Leanne about the strange things on the shores of Loch Ness. I do know that we have Carl, who's done a lot of research into all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff appertaining to Lake Baikal, the place where the seals that Max filmed in Moscow came from. And, yes, there's all sorts of other things in the pipeline, but in next month, specifically, I have no idea. But I'm sure it's going to be really rather cool. And then there's this. If you want to support us, and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page, and check out our Patreon.
thank you for watching this month's episode of On The Track. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something new. And if you did, put it down in the comments so we can see it. And we hope to see you next month. Goodbye. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's about it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you got something from it. Before we go, I'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who helped in this episode. And I'd also like to say to Charlotte, me, Archie, Wally the Comedy Rhinoceros and Karina, just to mention a few, are very, very grateful for all the support that we get from people each month, both here, both in the online, in the real world, and through our Patreon supporters. Guys, we are very, very, very grateful for everything that you do, because what you do makes it possible for us to continue doing what we do. So, as I've said, I have no idea what's happening next month, and in fact I don't really want to know what's happening next month. It would spoil the surprise for me as well as for everybody else. So, until then, be seeing you. Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's me again. Over the last few months you've probably noticed that On The Track has changed. Well, there's a very good reason for that. The thing is that between 2000 and 2017, that's 17 years for those of you who can't count, I was the main promoter of an annual event called The Weird Weekend. And it was a conference aimed at, about and for people from the Centre for Fortune Zoology. And although it wasn't all about cryptozoology, it was all full of events and lectures and film shows and ex exhibitions on subjects which I thought that people from the Centre for Fortune and Zoology would be interested in. And it was all wrapped up in a nice overcoat of surreal fun. And you know what? I miss it terribly, which is why about six months ago, I decided that I was going to rebrand on the track. I thought we'd do a monthly episode of about half an hour, and then in between each episode, we'd do what I call On The Track Extra, which resurrects somewhat of the feel of the old weird weekend. And have a look at these two examples, which I chose almost at random because I thought that you might enjoy them.